Agent Morris with the NSA. We have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. Traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some anomalistic motion of it. Uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or whether any direction it wanted to go, by could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. Wednesday night. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another live edition of Anomaly Now, straight out of Austin, Texas. I am your host, Smiles Lewis. This is the weekly live news roundup for the 501c3 nonprofit Scientific Anomaly Institute, aka Anomaly Archives. Thank you so much for joining us or for listening to the rebroadcast. If you can please do all the usual like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all this stuff, it really does help. We all are fighting the algorithms, aren't we? We can't quite get control of them. It, it, you just try and try and try. Anyway, it's, uh, it's been a very strange week. Shortly after this weekend's Patreon event, we learned of the crazy, terrible weirdness that happened this, this weekend. And I don't really have much to say other than, of course, I, I hope you agree with me that violence has no place in the world of politics and that we can do better as a people, as a nation, as a society on planet Earth here. There was actually something I just remembered that I had kind of wanted to read that was brought to my attention. I'm a huge fan of Terrence McKenna, and someone was recently quoting, I think Jay at Project Unity reposted uh, one of Terrence McKenna's 1988 lectures where he's talking about the ingression of novelty and his idea of the eschaton or the end of time. And something that was quoted by this individual from McKenna, I think it's just going to get weirder and weirder and weirder. And finally, it's going to be so weird that people are going to have to talk about how weird it is. At that point, novelty theory can come out of the woods because eventually people are going to say, what the hell is going on? It's just too nuts. I look for the invention of artificial life, the cloning of human beings, possible contact with extraterrestrials, possible human immortality, and at the same time, appalling acts of brutality, genocide, race baiting, homophobia, famine, starvation, because the systems which are in place to keep the world sane are utterly inadequate to the forces that have been unleashed. I should probably post the link to that, <laughs> that McKenna video, but Anyway, yes, what a weird time. But we had a great time at this this recent Patreon event. You can check out our website, of course, anomalyarchives.org, or you can go to patreon.com slash anomalyarchives and find out more about our become a patron, a donor, and we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, anything helps. A dollar a month, two dollars a month, five dollars a month. But if you go at the $10 a month Anomaly Academy cadet level, that gets, gives you access to a new live online lecture each month that you can participate in. And if you miss it, you can rewatch it and you also gain access to the ever-growing catalog of previous con online lectures. So uh, this past weekend, we hosted, of course, the wonderful Professor Wham, author of Mysterious Beauty. Living with the Paranormal in the Hudson Valley, I gave a great talk about, congratulations, you're a paranormal investigator. And we hope you'll consider checking it out. <laughs> Meanwhile, okay, so we have the usual mass sets of links over at our Anomaly Archives Flipboard, flipboard.com slash at Anomaly Archives. And tons of great stuff. 
not going to get to all of it, but actually we'll get, I'm going to try to get to a lot of it. And there's a few repeats in there, but just to jump right in, let's go for some anthropological information. You know, the Daily Mail, not a good news source, but I got to say, every time I come across an article, I finally, I often hear things for the first time from them. And, and then from there, I go and find the original source and try to find a better news source about whatever I'm reading. And this one is no different, but one of the things I do like about them is they're, of course, very sensationalistic, tabloidish. So they love photographs. They love images. And they don't disappoint with this one. Incredible new video shows uncontacted hunter-gatherer Mashko Piro tribe brandishing spears on the banks of a river in Peruvian rainforest. And of course, this is exacerbating concerns that the deforestation happening there is forcing them to, to leave their, their tribal grounds and encounter civilization, quote unquote, scare quotes, more and more. And this article over at dailymail.co.uk, it's been reproduced various other places, but they do have a lot of good pictures of it there, including the video here that you can see where on this bank, over like about two dozen or more of these natives find their way out to the water's edge. And clearly they are seeing somebody, whoever's taken this video footage and photographs. Anyway, this is just all news. And this is being reported by an organization called survivorinternational.org. And that the I have the link there to the, that organization. Survival International is now calling on the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, to withdraw its certifications of Katahau's operations and petitioning for support to help protect uncontacted tribes. The logging workers could bring in new diseases, which would wipe out the Mashkopiro, and there's also a risk of violence on either side. So it's very important that the ter territorial rights of the Mashkopiro are recognized and protected in law. This graphic here gives a pretty interesting overview of uncontacted tribes in, I believe, all these red spots. And this over here at the edge of Peru and Brazil and Bolivia is where this particular tribe is located, apparently. As I say, you could go to this link. We'll, of course, put all the links in the show notes. Yeah, over at survivalinternational.org, Peru, new images show uncontacted tribe dangerously close to logging con concessions. And this is clearly, this is like the press release for that other, the all the other articles out there. They literally have a link to their Google Drive with all the photos and video that are being used by Daily Mail and these other sites. But yeah, that's over here, download. And yeah, you know, I do re recall <clears throat> in high school, one of my sociology teachers telling us about this, at that time, known uncontacted tribe that years later, it <laughs> turned out to be fake. But to my knowledge, this is absolutely legit. Meanwhile, in other cryptozoological, no, excuse me, in other anthropological news, over at theconversation.com, a struggling people languishing across barren lands? No. Evidence shows life in ancient Saudi Arabia was complex and thriving. This article by Jane McMahon, I believe, again from a press release, having to do with an article that's been published recently. And so previously they, they assumed that the life in where it was presumed to be largely desert 6,500 to 8,000 years ago was not as significant or as developed as it now turns out to be from this research. Yeah, Jane McMahon, research associate from Discipline of Archaeology, University of Sydney, the piecemeal evidence available hinted traditional ideas of the small struggling groups constantly on the move across the barren lands needed to be revisited. Now an Australian-led team has released new research on monumental buildings we call, quote, standing stone circles. The findings are helping to rewrite what we know about the people who lived on this land between 6,500 and 8,000 years ago. Our evidence reveals what they ate, what tools they used, and even the jewelry they wore. It leads us to think these people weren't struggling so much after all, but rather had found complex and strategic ways to thrive on a land for millennia. Very interesting, comprehensive article and research paper. The research paper is, of course, available over at tnfonline.com. That's Taylor and Francis online. And the, the essay is 
been published in Levant, the Journal of the Council for British Research in the Levant, New Evidence for Neolithic Occupation in Northwest Arabia, Standing Stone Circles on the Harat, Uwaiurid. And yeah, this it's great, interesting information, lots of very interesting photographs. Now, the Standing Stone Circles, of course, that in, invokes this idea of ritual sites or other sites like Stonehenge. But the suggestion here is that these were homes and that they basically moved around still, that they were still somewhat nomadic, but that they did settle down and they did raise livestock and that they also claim were probably received, traded from northern climes. They say, ours is the first published evidence for domestic architecture from this period. These buildings are substantial, between four and eight meters wide. They are formed by two concentric rows of large stones placed end to end in a circle. They also talk about front entryways and finding tools and the bones and hides, apparently. That seems unlikely, I, the, the hides part, but they talk about them having a diverse diet. An analysis of the animal bones found inside the structure shows these people mostly ate domesticated species such as goats, sheep, and smaller number of cattle. They supplemented this with wild species such as gazelles and birds. This means they could respond to changes in their environment with flexibility, giving them resilience at a time when climate change would have been affecting the availability of water and vegetation. Their, this adaptability also extended to their use of plants. They left behind many grindstones, slabs of salt worn flat by the grinding of wild grasses and local plants. Nomadic or mobile, we assume that people didn't stay in one place since they lived in buildings that could be partially dismantled and moved. Goats and sheep also need fresh pastures and water to survive. That said, these people spent enough time at each site to justify the time and effort required to source and manipulate basalt blocks weighing up to one ton each. This suggests they returned to these locations time and again for hundreds of years, if not more than 1,200 years. Fascinating. Anyway, you can check that out over at theconversation.com or the original article over at enfonline.com. And in some sad news, Wizard of the West, Tony Shields, Tony Doc Shields, has passed away. He apparently passed on July 12th of this month. He's the so-called Wizard of the West. And uh, yeah, I first heard about this from our friend John Downs, the Center for Fortean Zoology. Shields was apparently 85 or 86. You might not know about him, but you undoubtedly I saw the results of his efforts, including some famous cryptid and monster sightings, uh, photographs in, included, and his, his tales of the Owlman. Now, this man was a magician. He, some believe he was totally a con artist and a hoaxer, but whatever you think of him, it was definitely made life interesting for the rest of us. Shield's most celebrated work was Monstrum, A Wizard's Tale, and I believe the back of it says something to the effect of the extraordinary and entertaining inside story of one man's relationship with the mysterious monsters of our ancient waters and other strange phenomena set against a colorful background of Gaelic folklore, pagan magic, surrealism, international monster hunting, and psychic backlash. Hmm. So, yes, one of the more famous things that he was known for doing was having skyclad naked witches, who apparently were his daughters, performing these rituals at the water's edge of the lakes where these lake monsters and cryptids were alleged to exist. We've posted a link to, oh, there it goes, to this video, uh, old digitized or <laughs> screenshotted video of Doc Shields from 14 Times TV. doesn't really exist anymore as far as I know, but yes, it's, it's a kind of a rough old oops and then i just screwed it up man i am pressing all the wrong buttons tonight sorry folks yeah right i just want to be sure not to show the sky clad <laughs> daughters they're all adults as far as i know filmed in cornwall 1997 interior shots from tricarne and falmouth monster mind the doc shield story is available on amazon all right, well, let's get to some UFO stuff, uh, shall we? <laughs> All right, moving right along. So, Ryan Sprague, someone I really like, 
in the UFO field, a, one of the new young guns has done an article over at his Medium blog, ryan-sprague51.medium.com. UFO incident and nuclear complex still perplexes today. Now, this is a case I'm not that familiar with, but definitely enjoyed reading this article. Security officers report alarming amount of aerial phenomena over Indian Point in New York. And, uh, of course, this is going back to 1984 when there was this massive flap along the Hudson River Valley, a lot of which is talked about in Mysterious Beauty, Professor Wham's book. And it's, it's, uh, it, this, the series of incidents allegedly occurred in the midst of this ongoing flap. And there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in the Hudson Valley region, as chronicled in Wham's book. But I, I must say, and this is no criticism of Ryan, I, I wish this was this article was actually cited. There doesn't appear to be any citations or the information in it. But basically, the story is that security and the radar operator witnessed both visually and on radar a unknown, mysterious, triangular, large, 900 feet across, triangular object silently hovering over the reactor, and then shooting up into the air, so rising and then departing quickly. And also there were reports that the radiation gauges increased as if the level of radiation was increasing, not dangerously, but enough to huh, obviously note. Now, what I find frustrating, besides the lack of citation, is just the, the nature of this case because now if you if you go to wikipedia the 1984 hudson valley ufo sightings there is a subsection on the indian point power plant sightings and here you can see it says center for ufo studies ufologist philip imbrogno stated he was approached by several guards from the indian point nuclear power plant according to imbrogno on june 14th and july 24th ryan's article only talks about the July 24th incident, apparently. The guard saw a 900-foot UFO hovering over the plant for 15 minutes. One security guard said it was 100 feet long and 300 yards above the plant and looked like helicopters in a V formation. Hmm. Security guard said that, quote, the guards broke out the shotguns, and Brogno told the Journal News that, quote, the commander gave the order to pull out the shotguns and they summoned Camp, Camp, Camp Smith, but we have no documentation. There's more information there, but not that much. Now, of course, some of this was also probably documented in this famous book of the time, Night Siege, the Hudson Valley UFO Sightings, published in September of 1987 by Dr. J. Allen Hynek, woohoo, and Philip Imbrogno with Bob Pratt. Now, I, I have not really seen any critiques of this book, but here's the, here's the problem. Imbrogno, Philip Imbrogno is the problem. I don't know how much this case relies on him, but he was discredited in 2011 when Lance Moody and others... Did I did not put the links here? I thought I did. Maybe I didn't open them, but arch skeptic Lance Moody, who is an acquaintance of mine, brought to the world's attention the fact that Philip Imbrogno appeared to be lying about his education as claiming that he was from MIT and that he'd gone to University of Texas and other locations. And as Lance Moody dug into this, he was not able to verify any of this. And the responses that Phil and Brogno gave did not add up and seemed more and more sus. Now, there is this interesting bit here. Victor, you may want to make that bigger. Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, CAUSE, C-A-U-S, submitted a FOIA request for information about this particular incident. I love this cursive <laughs> type setting font. This was respectfully submitted by Lawrence Fawcett, very famous classic researcher, assistant director for Citizens Against UFO Secrecy. This was submitted back in November of 1984. And the response, of course, is, a search of our files indicates that there are no documents pertaining to your request. And But the note here that it specifically says July 14th, 1984. 
And again, the wiki article, accurate or inaccurate, I'm not sure, specifically says June 14th and July 24th. So there we have a little bit of a discrepancy, obviously. And this is something that Kevin Randall and others have often mentioned that, at least with regard to Blue Book files, it was not unusual for Blue Book to get or choose the wrong date of a sighting that they were investigating and not get any feedback from witnesses and say case closed, there was nothing seen when in fact they were investigating the wrong date. And you can imagine with a FOIA request that people who don't want to give you information would certainly not correct you and go, oh, do you mean this other date? Well, no, pursue it to your specific request. So, hmm, just some thoughts there. But the other thing is, okay, with, with Imbrogno being discredited in 2011, and he completely disappeared from the UFO scene, I don't know that there's really been anything from him since then. His last book was on, at that time, he was promoting a book on Jin, and it would have been co-written, I believe, with, I think, Rosemary Guiley, if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. And his disappearance just kind of threw her under the bus. And she reported publicly that he had moved out of the state or was, was no longer active in UFO research or paranormal research. And then she said, and I've cut all ties from him. So it's my understanding, I believe that J. Allen Hynek passed away in 1986. So this book's publication in 87, with his name on it, would have been a posthumous publication, which I remember at the time. And I re I've read this book, and I don't remember anything untoward. It, it you know, just because you've got this co-author, Philip Imbrogno, who apparently was lying about his education, lying about his military service, and that gets a lot of people very angry doesn't necessarily invalidate all of his research and writings. However, you can obviously see why one would suddenly want to double check, verify, and not generally use anything he published as a citation or source in one's own research. Moving right along, hey, Ryan Sprague, yet again. He's done this before, he's doing it again. Anomicon, a virtual conference on the anomalous. This is coming up in September, I believe. And wow, what a lineup. And as far as I know, this is going to be a free online event with this amazing lineup of, what is this? Uh, six times like 36, however many presenters. Great bunch of folks. I don't know everybody on this list and some I know and am, am less interested in, but wow. Thank you, Ryan, for organizing such an amazing event, especially if it is, as I believe, free. Great folks like Joshua Cutchin, who's going to be giving a lecture for our Anomaly Academy cadet patrons next month in August. And folks like Rob Christofferson down here, he's the host of the just completed Our Strange Skies OSS podcast, a fantastic podcast. If you've never gone and listened to it, I highly recommend it. Sadly, he, he's ending that run. He's also been doing a a, I believe, web comic focused on UFOs for a long time. That's really great. And of course, Micah Hanks, Miguel, Paul, Kimball, just a whole bunch of great folks. So that looks very, very interesting. So more power to you, Ryan. Way to go. And, uh, you know, last week I mentioned, oh, where did I put it? Gosh, where did it? Oh, here we go. <laughs> I mentioned uh, this, this book. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Wilhelm Reich and versus the Flying Saucers by James Reich, an American tragedy. And sure enough, he's got the cover article on Santa Fe Reporter. James Reich's done this article. An eco psychologist investigates the 2024 Roswell UFO Festival. And uh, that's, that's great. You got this front page feature article, which you can read over at sfreporter.com, Space Oddities. And he got to meet, of course, some great famous folks like Travis Walton. There they are together. And he reports on the different lectures that he saw, different people that he met. Very interesting stuff. So can't wait to, to dig into that and to engage with Mr. Reich sometime in the near future after I've had the chance to read his book. 
but uh, kudos. So last week we reported on the efforts at chronicling all the theses, all the scientific literature on UFOs going back, I think, to it was 2014 onward. For some reason, this website isn't displaying correctly for me, but over at eurofo.net, that's E-U-R-O-U-F-O.net, is this list of university theses database. It is not displaying correctly right now. This is looks more like a, a hacked. <laughs> Thank you. There's what it was looking like earlier. I'm not sure what's going on here, folks, but Victor has brought up the, the way it looked when it was on my phone. Moving right along, uapcheck.com, which I think is affiliated with that Euro UFO net website. A new bibliography on the psychology of UFA, UAP experiences, a complete overview of scientific sources about eyewitness reliability and psychological aspects of the UFO experience. This was published just today over at uapcheck.com. And I, I look for more interesting things here at this website, even though, <laughs> like I said, it's giving me some troubles. On another page on that same website is this article, UAP in Africa, the reported sightings. Are UFO UAP visiting the Black Continent? How many case histories? When, where? By Eduardo Russo. Now, I haven't had a chance to digest this, but it's an analysis of all the sightings attributed to happening in Africa. And interestingly, I just saw on Facebook Martin Kottmeyer talking about his analysis of the sightings, and he comes up with radically different numbers than this research effort. So that in and of itself will be worth looking into. But of course, what also caught my attention is the use of the phrase, the black continent. And I don't think that's considered appropriate anymore. And in fact, when I was trying to look up, I, I'm, I grew up hearing reference to the dark continent. And that seemed like even then, as I was much younger, 20 years ago, that even then seemed antiquated and inappropriate. And sure enough, I found this article from NPR circa 2008. Should NPR have apologized for a reporter's use of the phrase, the dark continent? And they give their explanation for where that phrase originated, going all the way back, at least, I think, to the 19th century, 1878 book called Through the Dark Continent. And the, this, the explanation offered is a bit sketchy. All of this is to say, I, I'm, I don't think that the necessarily the author of this UAP check, UAP in Africa sightings catalog intended any offense, but I just wanted to acknowledge that and say, hey, folks might want to give it either a wide berth or a pass. I'm not sure. And moving right along. So how many of you remember SETI at home? You see that on the monitors here? This, is a, this mess of a room was where I lived when I first met my good friend and Anomaly Archives volunteer, Victor, back in the day, probably 2000, 2000. 2000 to 2002. And yeah, in this picture, there are at least five, com no, at least four computers going. I think all of them are Macs. And I believe every single one of them is running SETI at home, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence at home. You may recall that you could back then download a desktop app that uh, enabled you to download SETI sky search data and use your computer's power to crunch it. Now, I bring this up because back in March, I became aware of somebody whose YouTube channel I really enjoy, Professor Simon, aka Professor Simon Holland. And in March, down here, I believe, well, all oh, these aren't in order. Oh, well, back in, in March of this year, he started posting brief videos claiming that he was in contact with somebody who had been working on the SETI data and had basically, basically was claiming that this is just so wild. I remember at the time I got so excited by this and, you know, whether it proves to be true or not, it's, it's an interesting premise, but basically long story short, he, he 
so Simons relates that he's been told that they did, in fact, find a signal in the SETI at home process data. That, And when he first started talking about this in March, I believe he was saying sometime in the 1990s. Uh, of course, the, like I showed those photos, those would have been 19, or rather 2000 to 2002 period of time. And basically, he explains that apparently the the City at Home project was too successful. There were too many people downloading and running the stuff. And as he and others relate, and I remember plenty of people talking about this, people at com corporate offices would like set, uh, IT departments would set this up running on all the computers after hours. So it wasn't just people's homes, it was whole corporations. But Simon claims that he's been told that the, the SETI program ran out of data. And so, in fact, we were all churning over and over and over the same data over and over and over again. And that he describes it basically as being like, no, 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 maybe, no, 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 no. And that that maybe bump, you know, that, that bump of data in, of interest, if it was just the one time, would not be that significant. But this person who's feeding him this information is claiming that with the millions of people that reprocess it, that they were able to dig down into that data somehow. And back in March, he was, I think, going so far as to say that they had actually extracted images or some kind of information from the signal. And that this has been suppressed all these years, all these decades. Now, in, he's, he's come forward in the last day or two with a no, new couple of videos talking about this and giving a little bit more detail. There's been some other videos between March and now that, again, give a little bit of detail or go off in slightly different directions. But he's now saying that this occurred in 1999 and that this individual and or, it's unclear to me, a group of mostly, I think, European analysts took this data to the United Nations who basically said, huh, why don't you do some more research to make sure before we make any announce? Now, this is obviously a bit much to swallow. And I don't think Simon is trying to perpetrate a hoax or anything like that. I think he is doing his due diligence in terms as, as the best as he can research and understand stuff as a tinkerer, as an inventor, as a, as a, a fairly savvy scientist-y, scientific kind of person. But it's, it's a fascinating idea, and I, I really encourage you to watch the videos. I'm not going to play them. They're, they're not that long. You can go and watch. There's several of them. I've got links, or I will be posting the show links with lots of links to them. But his YouTube channel is Prof Simon Holland, and it, it's a really interesting idea. And he, the reason he decided to, to do a new video on this is he's implying that there's now been some kind of press release about this, but that the mainstream media are just downplaying it. And, and if you go back to all these videos, he gives a little bit of information on each of these past kind of developments related to this. And we see on, I think it's, I'm not sure which one it is, but one of these, he gives this synopsis. Now, he says on, 20, on April 29th, 2019, the Breakthrough Listen SETI project observed, and this is where it's allegedly coming from, Proxima Centauri with the Park's Muriang radio telescope. These data contained a narrowband signal with characteristics broadly consistent with a techno signature near 982 megahertz, BLC1. The signal appears to have originated from the direction of Proxima Centauri. It has been given the name Breakthrough Listen Candidate BLC1. As of December 2020, the researchers were still working on ruling out terrestrial interference. One researcher called it on par with the wow signal. Now, he then he's given links to various articles from going back to 2020. Space.com, ET signal from Proxima Centauri, a con conversation with Breakthrough Initiative's Pete Warden. The signal was probably just interference, but the search for techno signatures continues. So. This is all in reference to this other website called breakthroughinitiatives.org. And I can't 
find the particular press release that he's alluding to. It's all a bit un unclear to me, all the details, but he won't give up his contacts identity, though he says this is a, he's basically an astronomer and or mathematician who lives in southern Italy. Some other interesting things about this, he, he keeps kind of alluding to this being ma mainly European SETI folks as opposed to the American SETI folks. And he, but he did give the link to this breakthroughinitiatives.org site. And if you go to the board of this site, it's only, well, the three main people listed of the board of Breakthrough Starshot program are Stephen Hawking, of course, who passed away in 2018, Yuri Milner, founder of the DST Global, and Mark Zuckerberg, founder and CEO of Facebook. Not sure what to make of that, but there you go. But yeah, there there's links to these other articles. This one over at nature.com, analysis of the breakthrough listen signal of interest BLC1 with a technosignature verification framework. Of course, all of these articles, including this more recent one from 2021 that I was just referring to and the 2020, we've reported on on Anomaly Now before. It was back in, right, back in January of 2021, building Earth's largest telescope on the far side of the moon and some other articles, I believe, about this. But I... I also, in that, that show, sorry, this is a little divergent here, but was flashing back to 2010 when there was a strange global news hoax accident. Seems like a hoax where there was an alleged UN alien ambassador. And there really is, the person that they were talking about, it really is, was at the United Nations, but she said, no, I'm not some kind of alien ambassador for the UN, but the joke was her name was M. Othman, Maslin Othman, Mothman, M. Othman. Okay, not that funny, I guess. Anyway, I, anyway, I just got to say, uh, you really should check this out. It's a very intriguing idea. I'm sure I'm not the only one who gets a little giddy at the idea of a cover-up of such epic proportions, especially as it doesn't directly relate to UFOs, but relates to what so many people believe UFOs are about, and that is extraterrestrial intelligence and the possibility of us finally discovering some other technological civilization out there. Now, as I started to say, all the other articles that have covered this are, are saying, no, no, it's, it's radio interference, but they are spending billions of dollars on this new globally integrated array use, using all the different antennas to bring all this data together. And si Professor Simon claims that he's being told that this is all just an effort to try harder to dig down into the data on this other alleged Proxima Centauri signal. Okay. That's about it, folks. I, I just really sorry for the technical issues earlier. Yeah, we're not sure what happened. I it seemed suddenly we got kicked out of the studio, and but, and I'm a little discombobulated, partly because of that. But thank you so much for joining us. Really hope that you'll go to the Patreon website and consider becoming a a, a patron. And of course, last month in June we had our first presentation by Brent Raines, author of this wonderful John Keel book and longtime researcher himself. And of course, like I just mentioned, in this last weekend's presentation by Professor Wham on con congratulations, you're a paranormal investigator. And next month, I'm very excited to report on our upcoming presentation by Joshua Cutchin who's going to be talking about soul craft, understanding the UFO as a death symbol, which of course is just part of the thesis in the massive, amazing three-volume Ecology of Souls book, A New Mythology of Death and the Paranormal, which is just monumental. So thank you so much, and be good to each other. 
let's let's make this world a better place, please. Can we? All right. Good night. See you next week.